Hello and welcome to yet another tutorial. Today I'll be talking about what's new in GIMP 2.99.16, the latest development release version of GIMP. Before I get into that, don't forget to check out my GIMP 2.10 Masterclass from Beginner to Pro Photo Editing on Udemy. And you can also enroll in my WordPress for Beginners 2023 No-Code WordPress Masterclass also on Udemy. And I'll include links to these courses as well as all the relevant links from this tutorial in the description of the video. So let's dive in. The first piece of huge news that came with this release version is that the porting to GTK 3 Plus is now complete. GTK standing for GIMP Toolkit. That is the graphical user interface they use to make GIMP look the way it looks. They are on GTK 4 now at this point. But in order for GIMP 3.0 to come out, which we've all been waiting for for forever now, they need to port everything first to GTK 3 Plus. So that process has been completed and now they can sort of fix all the remaining bugs, the more minor bugs to get GIMP 3.0 out. They're going to have to have a couple of release candidates first, of course. But I do think that GIMP 3.0 is finally on the horizon. A lot of things have changed in the graphic design and photo editing world since they've been working on GIMP 2.10 going into GIMP 3.0, including AI just sort of disrupting everything and blowing everything up. But at least we can see the light at the end of the tunnel for GIMP 3.0. Aside from that bit of news, the first new feature that rolls out with this development release version is an update made to the search actions feature. And so to use this feature, we hit the forward slash key on the keyboard. I do have an entire tutorial dedicated to this, but now we're gonna get some brand new options here. So for example, when I type levels, of course, it'll take me to a list of all of the features in GIMP that have to do with levels. And if I wanted to use them, I can double click on the entry here in the search results. But the first new feature in here is that you're now going to see where in the menus this feature is located that's listed. For example, this first feature here is the levels tool and it's telling you you can find the levels tool inside the colors menu. So if I went to colors, right here, you're going to see we have levels. So it's telling you where this is located in GIMP. And that is, of course, if it is located inside the menu. Another new feature introduced for search actions is that you now have this little help manual icon. So right now I have levels here, the levels tool as the first entry. If I wanted to find out more about the levels tool inside GIMP's help manual, all I have to do is click this little icon here. And it might give you an error message if you don't have GIMP's manual downloaded and it'll ask you if you wanna view the manual online. And that's what's happened here. I've already gone through that process. So in my case, it just automatically opens the GIMP manual online in my web browser. And it takes me right here to the levels page in the help manual. And now I can read all about the levels. So I think that's super handy. It's just going to be a great way for people to quickly learn about the tools. So that should improve the user experience. And by the way, you can also open up the GIMP manual by hitting the F1 key on your keyboard. So as you can see, it has opened up to the image window inside the manual because that's what I'm looking at right now is the image window here for GIMP. The next new feature has to do with the paths tool. So let me grab the paths tool here from the toolbox. And you'll see by the way over here, the design looks a little bit different. I've also noticed that the tool options the dynamic feature here where it should adjust its size based on, you know, when you click and drag your mouse and change the width. I've noticed that these things don't really seem to be automatically resizing properly. Perhaps that's a bug. That's something I've noticed in this version in particular. But let me draw my path. And one other thing I noticed is that now your starting point here, the starting node has a directional arrow. So that's actually kind of cool. It just tells you what direction the path is heading in. It's only for the starting one. But the new feature I wanna highlight here is that when you come over here to fill path inside the tool options, now instead of it saying solid color and pattern, it's going to give you the option for foreground color, background color, or pattern. So basically it's separating foreground and background color now. So you can either fill it with you know, your white foreground color there or your red background color. And the reason for this they said inside of the release document is that they don't want people to have to come over here and switch, you know, whatever your background color is to your foreground because that was the default for the solid color option. Now instead, it's going to know, okay, I want to use my background color. Right now that's set to red. And when you click the fill option, it'll fill it in. I don't have a closed shape here. 
So you'll see it'll close it automatically there. But as you can see, it did fill that in with my background color. So that's super cool. And another cool feature with paths is if I come over here to where it says stroke path, now you're going to see we get a slightly different layout here. So now we have two tabs. We have one tab for the option to paint with a line. So you can stroke around the path with a line or you can use the paint tool to stroke the path and then you're going to have options like the paintbrush and any of the other brush tools here in GIMP. So before you didn't have the tabs, you just had a radio button and you would choose whether you wanted to draw a solid line or use the paint tools. So now because these are in two separate tabs, you now have more room for the options. So you have all the advanced options displayed now by default instead of there being a drop down. And in my opinion, I think this layout works a lot better because it shows people, hey, these are all the options you can add to your stroke. So for example, let's go with foreground color. So again, instead of just saying solid color, you get foreground color, background color, and now pattern as a radio option. And then of course you have the anti-aliasing checkbox there so you can smooth out basically as you go around curves. And then you've got your line width option, the cap style, join style. I won't go through all of these as I've done that many times throughout the years. But finally, when I hit stroke, now it'll stroke that path like it always does, but I just think that new layout is a lot better. Let's just hit Control Z to back up. The next new feature released with GIM 2.99.16 is going to be the ability to merge the menu and title bars up here into one single bar. These have always been two bars in GIMP. However, if you look at other graphic design or photo editing software, those software merge these two bars into one and it sort of declutters the user interface. I personally prefer that look. Apparently other people prefer this look here. I did run a poll on my YouTube channel and over 75% of people said they prefer having these two bars merged together. So now GIMP does come with the option to merge these two together. And you can do that by going to edit, preferences, and we can scroll down here to image windows. And now you're going to see the option here to merge menu and title bar. And then you'll get a message here saying GIMP will try to convince your system not to decorate image windows if it doesn't work properly on your system, i.e. you get two title bars, please report. So this is experimental right now, but basically not every operating system handles this feature well. But let me click OK. I am going to have to reset GIMP in order for this to display, which is what this is telling me. So I'll click OK. And we're just going to close down GIMP. And let's reopen GIMP. Okay, so now GIMP is reopened with this merged title and menu bar. But this to me looks way more modern, way more low profile. So I just really like this overall. It's more minimalistic. Gives you more room just to create and not have so many menus and different things in the way, windows, etc. And like I said, 77% of people prefer this in the YouTube poll that I did as well. So hopefully they can get the bugs and compatibility issues worked out on this and going forward they can stick with this menu. Another UI feature they updated is that they now have more dark themes. So let's go to edit, preferences, and we'll come over here under interface and click theme. So they tweaked the default dark theme so that it's not as dark and it has a bit more contrast. And then they added this darker dark theme. So you'll see there it's called darker. This has way less contrast. They said they might get rid of this entirely. I don't really care if they do. I do like the default one better. But some of you may prefer the much darker screen. Maybe that's better on the eyes. You'll also see, by the way, you have a compact theme here and a lighter system theme. I'm sorry, a lighter gray theme. The system theme is the default that we've been using. So that gray theme is lighter and you'll see the icons are dark there. So let's stick with the default. I do think the new default looks pretty nice and I'll click OK. The next new feature is that the text tool can now have the text dialog hidden. So if I click on my composition and I just type some text, you're going to see here we have this little box up top here. This is the on canvas editor. You can now hide this if you don't need it or you just want it out of the way by coming over here to the tool options and you'll see this checkbox that says show on canvas editor. By checking that it allows this to disappear. And by the way, I did notice a bug while I was testing all this out 
And the bug is that you'll see here, we can see the layer boundary of the text layer. Usually when you click on another layer, that layer boundary will switch to the layer that you are clicked on. However, in this case, you'll see that the layer boundary remains the text layer boundary despite being on this image. However, when I click the show hide icon, you'll see it now selects the layer boundary of the image. And when I show the text again, we're still on the image boundary. But if I click on the text, it does not select the text boundary. I have to once again click show hide. For whatever reason, that seems to fix the problem. The next new feature I'll cover is that the align and distribute tool receives some more tweaking. So if I come over here to the move tool and I select align and distribute, I laid out all the new features in my what's new in GIMP 2.99.14 tutorial for this tool. So they did change a lot of things and I had some bones to pick with the new way of doing things. You'll also see again right here that this is not properly updating the size. Um, it seems to just sort of stop changing the size once you reach a certain width. That appears to be a bug, but you now have this new relative to option and you can select picked reference object. And so now you can center up objects based on the pixels inside of a layer instead of always needing to center based on the layer boundary itself. So let me just demonstrate by creating a new layer. We'll name this circle and grab the ellipse select tool, draw a circle here real quick, fill it in with red, control shift A to deselect that. So we've got this circle here and the size of the layer is the size of the entire image. But if we wanted to align just the pixels in the circle to the pixels in the text, this new align and distribute feature allows you to select the selected layers option, and then use extents of layer contents. So that's the option you select to align based on the pixels. And then you can align relative to whatever the picked reference object is. So let's go with these two layers here. So I'll hold shift and click to select both items. And now I need to click to select a picked reference object. So let's go with the text. And now I'm going to align this and you'll see the circle will now align to the pixels of the text. So I do believe the functionality of the align tool is better, but I think the user experience is not quite as intuitive anymore because it's a bit complicated. So we'll see how that evolves over time. Another brand new feature introduced in GIMP 2.99.16 is a new chamfer filter. So let's come over here and just select the circle layer and delete that. So we're on this text layer here. If I go to filters, light and shadow, chamfer, we now get this new Gego filter that kind of creates 3D text. I mean, not really. This is based on Linux Beaver's experimentation with shading when it comes to creating 3D text. I know he's got his own proprietary Gego filters he's created, which look pretty cool. But there are a bunch of settings you could tweak here to improve the look of this. I think this is a bit of a work in progress because I don't know what you could use this for, this look, because it doesn't look quite 3D and it doesn't seem to quite interact properly with the text, but it does give it a little bit of a 3D pop. So you guys can feel free to experiment with that and maybe you'll get something cool out of it. So I'll click OK. Another new feature that is rolled out with 2.99.16 is the ability to copy the transform matrix of the Unified Transform tool. So let me open up this tool to demonstrate this new feature. So I'll come over here to Unified Transform. So over here, you'll see we have a transform matrix with a bunch of numbers. And whenever you, you know, adjust this, you transform this, the matrix numbers update automatically. Well, supposedly these numbers are useful in other software, so you can copy the matrix and you could paste it onto something else so that it basically copies and pastes the transformation, I believe. However, this has been really buggy in my experience. So if I go to select all this text and then I right click on it, I get a fatal error. I'm not sure if that's how you're supposed to copy this. That's how I assume you're able to copy and paste this. But as you can see, we get the fatal error. I click OK and GIMP shuts down. So that feature does not work for me on Windows. Moving on, GIMP now has the ability to create a new layer and fill it with middle gray. Not exactly the most exciting new feature, but if I click here to create a new layer and I come down here under fill with, we now have middle gray with the CIE lab. I don't know how to pronounce that, but this basically just gives you a totally middle gray between black and white. 
So let me just delete that. A couple of other development items I'll mention real quick. Number one is that file format support continues to increase in GIMP, and that is a result of some of the contributions from the former Google Summer of Code student, Alex Sa, who formerly went by Nick. And I guess one of the focal points for GIMP going forward is that they want GIMP to be able to open up pretty much any file format. Doesn't matter when the file format was created, they wanna be able to open it. And the reasoning behind that is that it should make it easier for organizations to archive older files. And finally, GIMP has reworked some of the code when it comes to creating Gaggle filters so that anybody who's creating their own custom Gaggle filter can add that filter to the main menus here inside of GIMP. Now I am not a developer, so I'm not gonna go into this in detail because I just don't know enough about the subject. However, you will see that GIMP's developer website does include a lot of information about how to make your own Gaggle filters and how this new feature works. In my limited knowledge, I believe it implies that it should be easier going forward for people to create third-party plugins and to make those plugins easier to find inside of the menus. And so I'll leave you with this, some good news. GIMP saw an increase in participation from developers contributing to the program. As I mentioned on Twitter, they went from 16 to 34 contributors, and that is a 113% increase. And they also saw an 82% increase in the number of translators contributing, going from 17 to 31. That's going from 2.99.14 to 2.99.16. So it does appear that GIMP's contributions are on the rise. Hopefully that means we're gonna get more features in GIMP, more new versions of GIMP, and in a shorter period of time. All right, so that's it for this tutorial. Hopefully you liked it. If you did, don't forget to like this video, subscribe to my channel, and click the bell icon to be notified each time I have a brand new tutorial. You can check out any of the links related to this video in the description. But thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.